Ever stop to consider the power or subtle suggestion of a curse? We are used to the image of an old hag of a witch living in an insulated cabin who is frequently visited by an individual seeking a sick sort of justice. Rattle a few bones, stir a steamy pot, and utter a few chosen words, and our victim is cursed. However, fact is sometimes stranger than fiction. Case in point, the famous film director, Orson Welles. Some say that he was cursed. Hello, I am author Donald Allen Kirch. This is Stranger Than Fiction. Forget the world you know. Enter a bizarre dimension where the strange and unusual guide your imagination towards the unimaginable. Life is stranger than fiction in these true stories, where the ordinary is replaced with the extraordinary. Explore strange legends, weird myths, and odd folklore. The facts are laid before you to examine. You're invited to draw your own conclusions on these true stories of the paranormal. connected with film and film lore has learned or heard of the legendary Orson Welles. Some remember him as a stern director, others an admirable artist, still others as an arrogant son of a bitch. One thing is certain, he had talent. There is not a soul alive unless they are allergic to culture itself, which has not marveled at his epic masterpiece, Citizen Kane or submerge their imagination into the darkness of Touch of Evil. Orson Welles was many things, but he should be remembered as one of the greatest filmmakers of the 20th century. Welles gained both national and international acclaim after his disastrous War of the Worlds broadcast on October 30th, 1938. While performing in an anthology series entitled Mercury Theater on the Air, at the Columbia Broadcasting System Radio Network, Wells created a series of Real to Life, fictional broadcasts about Earth being invaded by aliens from another planet. The program was indeed too real and so official sounding that it caused a nationwide panic. What made this broadcast seem real were the simulated news bulletins and the sad fact that Mercury Theater on the Air was a sustaining show, which meant that there were no commercials to help cease the illusion. If folks turned in halfway into the program, or as little as five minutes into it, there would have been no theme music, no introduction to prepare the audience for the fiction that they were being subjected to. No one would have believed in the last years of the 19th century that human affairs were being watched from the timeless worlds of space. No one could have dreamed we were being scrutinized as someone with a microscope studies creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Few men even considered the possibility of life on other planets. And yet, across the gulf of space, minds immeasurably superior to ours regarded this earth with envious eyes. And slowly and surely, they drew their plans against us. As modern-day skeptics, we snicker at the foolishness of those unfortunate listeners. Take this into consideration. This was prior to the Second World War. Hitler was fast becoming the nightmare the world would know him to be. And international economics made today's problems look like a cakewalk. The atmosphere for tension was indeed there. There are independent researchers who claim that more than six million people heard Wells' broadcast. Over half believed him. Wells had the Martians landing in a small town called Grover's Mill, New Jersey. There are legends and anecdotal episodes which claim that the citizens of the tiny hamlet ventured out to find the invading aliens, only to spot water towers above the tree lines firing their shotguns in panic. Other reports indicated that curious scientists camping in the area had been listening to the program and decided to investigate. Wells' talent was so good, he even frightened those individuals considered too smart to be fooled. In any case, 
Grover's Mills Police Department still considers the whole event embarrassing. That was the power of Orson Welles. In 1941 and into early 1942, Welles was king of Hollywood. No one had ever encountered such a genius or rising star. Some compared him to the MGM vice president, Irving Thalberg. Whatever he wanted, he got. Whatever he needed, it was only for him to ask. All marveled at the commercial success of Citizen Kane, and the sky was truly the limit. The burning question in Hollywood at that time was, what would the new boy wonder do next? To the surprise of the Western world, Orson Welles had decided to travel south to the nation of Brazil to film, of all things, a documentary. See, I was in terrible trouble then because I was sent to South America by Nelson Rockefeller and Jock Whitney. I was told that it was my patriotic duty to go and spend a million dollars shooting the carnival in Rio. Now, I don't like things like carnivals and Mardi Gras and all that, but uh, they put it to me that it would be uh, a real contribution to inter-American affairs in the Latin American world and so on. So without a salary, but with a budget of a million dollars, I was sent to Rio to make up a movie about the carnival. But in the meantime comes the new government. Archeo is now a new government. And they ask to see the rushes of what I'm doing in South America. And they see a lot of people, black people, and uh, the reaction is, he's just shooting a lot of jigaboos jumping up and down, you know? They didn't even hear the samba music because it hadn't been synced up. So I was fired from Archeo. And they made a great publicity point of the fact that I had gone to South America without a script and thrown all this money away. That, I never recovered from that, uh, from that attack. There is one simple reality one should always remember, especially when working in Hollywood. Where one gains success, one also gains enemies. The name of his documentary was It's All True. Wells himself had always been fascinated by the occult and the bizarre and thought that such a film centering upon both would be quite an escape for the American movie-watching audience. Years and indeed decades later, he would wish that he had turned his eyes to other things. First off, one of the subjects of his film drowned. Others in Hollywood, seeing his latest venture as a ridiculous waste of funds, decided to pull his accounts. After a rather disastrous review of Wells' latest film, The Magnificent Ambersons, still others saw an opportunity to destroy a major threat to their own work. They egged the studio heads into noticing certain flaws in Orson Welles' career and looked for petty ways of destroying him. They succeeded. Funding for It's All True was soon cut and Orson Welles' project was never finished within his lifetime. With all his capital taken away, it became the sad duty of the Hollywood director to inform both cast and crew of their unfortunate end. Some within the casting did not take the news well. One, a powerful and important voodoo witch doctor. In pointing out the politics of Hollywood, to this witch doctor, and while patiently waiting for his interpreter to explain his embarrassment, Orson Welles was met with violent opposition. The witch doctor had been promised a featured role in a voodoo ceremony. This, of course, was quite an ego boost to the local priest, and I'm sure he bragged about it. Why wouldn't he? To be told by another that what he had been promised was suddenly and without proper logic taken away from him must have been quite an indignity. This was when Orson Welles' life became cursed. While cleaning out his Brazilian office, he soon discovered a copy of his shooting script sitting upon his desk with a steel needle piercing all the way through it. Upon the projected end of this needle was tied a frayed piece of red thread. This was the mark of the voodoo. In later interviews, 
Wells had stated he knew what this was. He had been cursed by the insulted witch doctor and that things would never again be the same. Friends and colleagues tried their best to poo-poo the magic away, but Wells himself, a believer in the occult, seemed to know otherwise. Before Brazil, Wells was king. Afterwards, he couldn't catch flies if he was covered with honey. Disappointment after disappointment plagued his life after that paranormal moment. After Citizen Kane, years later, Wells' next masterpiece, Touch of Evil, had been illegally taken away from him, edited beyond recognition, and most of his other projects canceled, unfinished, or rarely seen in their entirety, even to this day. As time passed, the famous director's shine started to leave his armor. Wells became something of an embarrassment to those who once knew him and praised him. He was forced to take on several odd jobs as narrator of B films, doing a series of famous wine commercials, and teaching several actors and actresses the art of theater. It took Beethoven four years to write that symphony. Some things can't be rushed. Good music and good wine. Paul Masson's Emerald Dry. A delicious white wine. Paul Masson wines taste so good because they're made with such care. What Paul Masson himself said nearly a century ago is still true today. We will sell no wine before it's time. No prophet is ever accepted within his own time, nation, or people. That was truly the case for Orson Welles. He was once a bright light, proclaiming to any and all what hard work and talent were capable of within the boundaries of a free society. Then, nothing. Could it have been the curse? Curses, by their very nature, cannot work unless the victim believes. Wells always believed that he had been cursed by the Brazilian witch doctor in question. Therefore, one has to ask the question, was it voodoo, or was it Wells himself who had caused such havoc? In the early 90s, a group of Wells' close friends bought back the rights to It's All True, restored most of the existing negatives, and edited the film into its entirety using Wells' personal notes as their sole guide. Upon completion, out of respect for the late director's personal views upon the occult, a local Hollywood witch doctor was asked to ease the curse placed upon Wells so many decades ago. This was done, albeit to the ridicule of the film establishment. It's All True is currently available as a DVD and can be viewed by any and all who appear interested in learning more about this amazing man and his wonderful talents. Orson Welles passed into memory in 1985, never again achieving his full measure of respect. His last job, a voice character in the animated classic Transformers, the movie. Weak and approaching the end of his life, he was heard saying, You want to know what I'm doing? I'm playing a voice of a toy in a useless venture. Here is part of that interview, which was done eight days before his death. You know, my first picture would never have been made, never in a million years, if the producer had lived in Hollywood, he had any knowledge of Hollywood. It was a total accident, total piece of luck, like winning $600,000 from a quarter in a, in a jackpot. And it, it, it couldn't go on, and I knew that. Oh, yes, well, I've always hated Hollywood, but I hate almost everything in the modern world. And Hollywood is simply the most pleasant place to live in left. Well, I had a lot of options open. Everybody does. Anybody who, is, who has uh, enough sense to make a movie can make a lot of other things. And uh, I should have, I should have uh, finished right away because I saw right at the beginning that the odds, you know, it's like the two zeros on the wheel in Vegas. The odds are against the player here and are by the nature of movie making. What's wrong with this place is that this is another marketplace. And the marketplace is always the enemy of the artist. Not no place, but if, if 
they don't like what you do, really. I was going to show them that they were wrong. And I have spent the rest of my life showing people, trying to prove that what is said is wrong. And that's been an enormous waste of spirit and of energy. I don't believe there is any wisdom in compromise, unless you're a politician. And to the extent that movies are politics, I don't belong in movies. I cannot compromise. When I do something which is compromised, it is p more, it, it is poorer than a second-rate director's picture. My pictures don't work at all unless they work my way. It's not because I think they're better that way. They simply fall apart unless they're done my way. You know, I, I am a romantic, and I was a romantic in the early 19th century way. I wanted every experience, every kind of thing, and so I went to Hollywood in that spirit, and I should have left in that spirit because I have wasted my life trying to prove that they, uh, uh, you know, and what I want to be is, is you know, the, the, the black hats and the white hats. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to be a white hat, and I'd rather be remembered as a good guy than as a difficult genius. To the skeptic in all of us, take heed. Curses can hold incredible power if the victim simply believes. Well, this concludes our journey into both the strange and the bizarre. If you are curious to read some of my personal works, please go to donaldallenkirch.com. That's Donald Allen, A-L-L-E-N, Kirch, K-I-R-C-H, one word, donaldallenkirch.com. So until then, I wish you unpleasant dreams. Good night.